things you can only see under the microscope. This chapter we're studying multicellular producers. Multicellular means there are many, many cells together, so you can see them with the naked eye very often if they're big enough. Uh, and uh, producers means they make their own food. So they're photosynthetic. They use sunlight to make their own food. Multicellular producers. That is a big bunch kelp. of uh, algae. It's also <laughs> called kelp. I didn't know kelp. And uh, that to sun kelp they grow in the ocean and use the sunlight to make food. They can form huge forests, huge kelp forests that are very productive. Um, we don't have them on this coast, uh, but wherever there's a rocky coast, you can find them. They also like colder waters. Can you die? So you find a lot of them over on, uh, off the coast you, of California. Can you die from getting caught in like the kelp forest? You can. You can. As a matter of fact, divers who dive around kelp forests, they always carry a knife with them so they can cut themselves loose if they get caught up. And they also get lost. You could get lost, too. Aren't most of them like the ones who use rebreathers? I don't know. So they won't get caught? I don't know. There's some brown algae. Um, That's a really nice picture. Also related to kelp. These things have all sorts of... Uh, um, um, adaptations for being able to live away from water, um, for being able to survive harsh conditions. They have to be able to dry out a little bit, then they get wet again, um, live outside of the water. You find these in, uh, in tide pools and places that can dry out for a little bit of time. And uh, algae cannot live away from water for too long though. They have to be wet most of the time, but some of them have some adaptations where they can survive a little bit of drying out. And that's where we think plants came from. Plants came from an algae that got better and better at surviving drying out. Probably a tide pool algae somewhere where, the, where if the tide wasn't high enough, the pool would dry out and you'd be stuck with the algae there. And if it came up with a way to survive for a long period of time without water, then you got plant. And so we think plants came from a, a, a green algae. Now, you got to know all of the parts of the um, algae, the parts of these things. we got the hole fast on the bottom. That connects the algae to the um, surface. And uh, usually it requires a rocky surface. So just a muddy bottom won't work for most of these. That's why we don't have them right off of our coast right here. Um, we call that the hole fast. The hole fast is really strong. It digs itself into the rocks, and usually uh, it's the rock that breaks, not the plant, if the thing loses hold. Um, then it's got these little leaves on them, and we call those fronds. Can you say frond? Frond. That's like a fern frond. Um, kind of, the leaf of a fern is called a frond as well. But um, you can see it's, it's uh, the frond consists not only of the blade, the blade is the part that does photosynthesis, but it's also got a float on it. And that float fills up with air and maintains buoyancy for the, uh, for the blade. So because the float is full with air, the thing will stay up. If there were no floats on it, it would all sink and be at the bottom of the ocean. And that's no good because the sunlight's high up, so you need the floats to support the thing. So you got the, the frond consists of the blade and the float and the stipe. The stipe is like the part of the stem that holds the, the blade and the float. So we call this like stem part, we call that the stipe. Those are the parts of an algae. A seaweed. You ever hear the term seaweed? Mm -hmm. That refers to all this algae that's growing in the in the ocean. Isn't that great? Yes. These algae are often harvested for chemicals that they have in their bodies. A lot of the algae produce kind of a waxy substance that we can use for a lot of things. 
Um, one of the substances that you get from algae are called agar. And we have agar dishes in biology labs that we grow bacteria on. Y'all ever seen those agar dishes? Mm -hmm. So if you take a red, they're made from red algae. And if you take these red algae bodies and you, and you kind of grind them up, you get this waxy substance that's in their bodies. And, and uh, bacteria love to grow on it. So you can put it in a dish and the bacteria will grow all over it, eat it up and, and multiply. Um, they also use some of this substances, agar, um, to make uh, dairy products like ice cream. You know, ice cream's kind of got a thickness to it, a, a consistency to it that's a little bit like wax, maybe. You know, it's not liquid, and it, but it's not solid. It's kind of in between the two. So that's uh, kind of waxy. That's that's comes from um, agar and other products that algae have. So like. The two percent milk and stuff feels like it's not as like thick. Yeah. So is that all you're getting taken out and stuff? Uh, no, that no. That's that's other stuff that's actually stuff? comes from the the cows. But um, like so yeah, they don't put stuff from algae into the milk. Carrageenan is another product. Have you ever poured salad dressing and it's kind of thick? Mm -hmm. In syrupy, the thickness comes from this product called carrageenan, which they also get from algae. So algae are really harvested um, for stuff, and so we depend on algae. And um, most of the harvesting is done in Asia. They have big ships that go around and scoop up algae and, and farm. It's called seaweed farming. <coughs> Video footage of seaweed farming. They're graceful, they're beautiful, it's like a symphony. I'm Captain C. No! And Captain C is interested in Don't eat that. the most important resources that we have sea vegetables, a virtuous vegetable. Mama eats seaweed crisps. <laughs> So when we go out into the uh, open waters of one hour, he probably time, makes it. Quiet, please. You know this, that these plants that are reproductive have a beautiful brown stripe on them. This beautiful brown stripe produces millions of microscopic spores. We are bringing these spores into the laboratory so they will settle on the seed string. 24 hours, I was fullest from a very light brown coat. Once the material is macroscopic, the size of a pinhead, we can take that seed string and unravel it on long lines in the sea. three um, seafood Dang. restaurants in Brooklyn, and it's also going to the dressing room um, uh, in Westport. Westport. We're moving onions. When you get it fresh, it's sweet, and it's, it's a smooth texture, and this is both in a dinner plate. This will create jobs here. I think this uh, shows the value of Yukon science uh, to our economy.
Yay. Yeah. Still here, very bad to me. Does anyone here ever eat sushi? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Usually, what they'll do uh, before they cut the sushi up, they'll wrap it in in algae, and they'll wrap they'll they'll take the rice and the meat, and then they'll wrap it in this algae, and then they'll cut it, and so your your little thing of sushi will have a black wrap around it. That's algae. But you're eating algae when you eat. It's good. I like it. I love it. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's a big food source. Algae's good. Hey, there's a guy with a bunch of algae. Huh. This stuff will just wash up on the beach. Now, we do get it around here washed up on the beach. When there's a big nor'easter, you know what that is? It's a storm that blows out of the northeast. It usually happens in the winter. There's a whole bunch of this algae that's floating around out in the middle of the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, it, a storm will blow it in, and, it'll, and there's uh, some of this brown algae. Most of the brown algae is attached at the bottom with the, with the holdfast, but there are some types of brown algae that just float on the top. And some of those that just float on the top get blown in Which one? And, um, and end up on our shore. And you can sometimes in the winter, after a big storm, you can walk out there, and it'll be all over the beach. What kind can you eat? Um, you can't eat all kinds. All kinds don't taste good. Um, but uh, that's a good question. I don't know like the species name or anything like that. They eat a lot of this brown algae, which is called kelp. This is a red algae. Um, you find red algae usually in uh, colder waters, deeper waters. And um, it's got uh, red pigments in it that don't absorb red light, they absorb blue light. Do you all know the colors of the uh, spectrum? Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. So a lot of the algae that's in deeper waters, what color penetrates deep waters the best? Blue. 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 So they'll have high absorbance, if this were an absorbance graph, they would have high absorbance in the blue and indigo and violet and low absorbance on the red side. So they really absorb, the pigments really absorb blue light because that's the kind that makes it down to these algae. Doesn't absorb red. Why absorb red if there's no red light down there? So that's why these things look red when you look at them. It's because the red is not being absorbed. If light bounces off, if you shine a flashlight at it, the red light bounces off the blue light's absorbed, and so it looks red. That's why most of these algae that you find that are red out here are living in deeper waters. Not, but not so deep that no light can get to it. You don't find these algae living that deep where no light can, gets down there because they can't do photosynthesis if it's that deep. Video footage of red algae? Of course. Red algae are so exciting. There it is. Can you restart it? I wasn't ready. You want to restart it? Yes. Red algae, baby. I like the noise the most. It's like it's breathing. It's breathing. Moving back and forth because the, the current, that's the current of the water going back and forth. Remember how we talked about the wave particles go back and forth as the waves move? Wave, yeah. This is green algae. Oh, there's some red algae. And the rest of it's green algae. Green algae is phytochlorophyta. I'm not going to make you know the five names. There's a bunch of different types of algae. There's green algae, there's red algae, there's brown algae. You do need to know that brown algae is commonly called kelp. It was green algae that we think evolved into modern day plants. Why do we think green algae evolved into modern day plants? Because they're green. They make good. Um, for several reasons. Plants are green and those are green, but uh, if you look if you look at the chemistry of the thing, 
Green algae have chlorophyll A okay. and chlorophyll B. Plants have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Green algae have cell walls made of cellulose. Plants have cell walls made of cellulose. The different types of cell walls <coughs> and, and other uh, types of algae. Come on in. Thank you. <coughs> There's another one. Green algae I'm forgetting. Does anyone have their book open? I do. I'm forgetting what the what's the third thing? Green algae have chlorophyll A and B. Green algae have cellulose cell walls. Um and xanthophyll is xanthophyll is a pigment. Yes. Yeah. Green algae have a pigment called xanthophyll. And beta carotene. Beta carotene. Carotenes and xanthophyll. So these are other pigments that absorb light. Carotene and xanthophyll. These are all pigments. Is it that they store carbohydrates in the cell? Yeah, that was the one I was thinking of. Uh, starch. That was it. Um, plants store their food, their extra glucose that they make. So glucose is made through photosynthesis. In plants, it's stored as a molecule called starch. Starch are a bunch of these glucoses hooked together to make a long line, um, a big, uh, uh, long carbohydrate. Um, it's, it starch is like a special structure that most algae don't store their, their food as starch. They store it in other ways. But uh, uh, green algae store it as starch, and plants store it as starch. So all of these are similarities. So plants must have come from green algae. Look at all that green algae, y'all. These are sea grasses. Now, sea grasses are flowering plants. Uh, flowering plants only came about relatively recently. But uh, they're plants. They're not algae. And so they're related, they're closely related to trees and, and grass like you see, but they've gone back to the water and are only found in the water now. We call them uh, sea grasses. And they're, they're different than algae because uh, they have a lot of the modifications that, uh, that are more modern from, from modern plants. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of sea grasses. Uh, manatee grass. Um, they call it that because manatees like to swim around in it and eat it. And these are growing on the bottom of the, uh, in, in the mud at the bottom of, um, of the shallow oceans. And um, especially where the water's not, not moving, the currents aren't too hard to, to where they'll dig these things up. We don't have them off the coast. Um, off of our oceans where the waves are crashing because the substrate is mixed up too much it can't get a hold in there it would just be dug up but if you go to um, if you go to look at some of the tidal creeks and stuff like that you might find some of these grasses up in there another reason we don't have a lot of these grasses even in our tidal creeks is because it's too muddy the mud uh, from the marshes uh, our tides come in and come out we have very strong tides here. It removes the mud from the marshes, and the mud fills our, our tidal creeks, and sunlight can't get through it very well. So you don't have much plant growth on the bottom. But in places where the tides aren't so strong, if you go down up, up to North Carolina, or go down to near Miami and South Florida there, the, the tides aren't as strong. It doesn't pull up as much marsh mud and you have a lot more of these grasses growing on the bottom of the tidal creeks. So anyway, manatee grass uh, looks like these thin blades. And eel grass is another kind. Paddle grass, it doesn't, this isn't a good picture. I need to get a bit of, better picture of paddle grass. But the, the, the blades look like paddles, like, uh, like you would paddle somebody with. We have those in the fraternity. If they stole your paddle, they hit you with it. This is what you do in a fraternity. So you had to carry your paddle, you had to hang on to it at all times, really strong. The brothers are trying to take it. 
<laughs> if they got it, they'll smack you. I don't know if they can still do that. You get, now you get sued. <laughs> no hazing. No hazing. We had no extra hazing, hazing when I was little. <laughs> um, turtle grass kind of looks like that, and surf grass are real thin little pieces. So there's a bunch of different types of grasses out there. Would you like to see video footage of sea grasses? Yes. Is that your favorite thing, Austin? Yes. <laughs> Video footage of seagrass. Good shot. Rocky. Dr. David Kimber and Dr. Raymond Hughes look to unlock the secrets of the inner tidal zone. They will land next to the sea. You've got the coral reefs. It's so obvious they're beautiful. There's fish around them. But you look at seagrass and most of them don't like it. You don't like walking on the seagrass. You like. I got a scalloping. No, no, never mind. I want to get So you can see this bay here. Um, see how well it's protected from the ocean? It's got this, it's got land all the way around it here. Water can come in and out, but you're not going to get real strong waves in here because of the protection here. That's perfect place for seagrass. So that's one reason why they're there stuff. Bay Peninsula State Park. Randall has been using the grass in St. Joe Bay as part of a study into understanding its decline. I've been working with Randall on seagrass ecosystems and we believe they're one of the most important ecosystems on the earth. They're active nursery habitats for a lot of commercially important fish species. So it's estimated worldwide seagrass habitats probably support around 50% of the world's fisheries. Scout. And so as we lose these seagrass habitats, we lose the fisheries. In addition to this, they clean the water of nutrients and prevent erosion. And scientists are just beginning to fully understand one surface in particular. Capture carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the sediments at a rate of about 30 times faster than tropical rainforests, which are the most powerful carbon sinks on land. And here's what's really unique about these seagrass ecosystems. They can store that carbon for thousands of years. Carbon. The question is, as we lose seagrass beds, what happens to that carbon? And how might it affect global climate change? Dr. Randall and Dr. Raymond Hughes are working on the ground. Where is that bay again? Yeah. Uh, here we go. Right there. Researcher Dr. Peter McCree. Looks like it. Dr. Raymond Hughes and visiting researcher Dr. Peter McCree are going snorkeling in St. Joseph Bay <coughs> Peninsula State Park. Raymond has been using the grass in St. Joseph. Is it Louisiana? I don't no. know. I think it's Florida. 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 Oh, Florida. Hey. Wait. All right, so it's not that big of a section, but it's on these multicellular producers, so make sure you read it. I got a few questions here oh, for you and your prior. You need to close your computer. Close your computers. Close your notes. Close that computer, Rocky. 